This week on Dish with Mary, I journeyed to the heart of Kamloops, British Columbia to meet the brilliant chef Sterling LaMarche from Right Eye Brewing. Get ready as he spices things up and brings a touch of his culinary magic to our kitchen. Together, we'll be whipping up mouth-watering five spice and eggplant pork sausage rolls. So grab your apron and let's dish. To me, cooking should be fun and finding ways to make it accessible is what motivates me. I love the sizzle of butter melting in a pan, the smell of cinnamon while I'm baking. I need to touch food while it's cooking and of course, taste it, even if I can't see it very well. The kitchen is my happy place. That's why I'm visiting chefs across Canada who feel the same way I do and inviting them to cook with me in my kitchen. Welcome to Dish with Mary. And just like that, we are back with season four. And we've got an extraordinary lineup this season. And we're starting with Chef Sterling from Bright Eye Brewing. Chef, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And Bright Eye Brewing is where Kamloops. Yeah, right in the central interior of British Columbia. Amazing. What are you cooking with us today? Today we are going to do a twist on an old classic. Everyone knows a sausage roll. Well, they don't know the way I do it. Okay. So we're gonna be doing a five spice and char roasted eggplant sausage roll with a sesame puff pastry. And then just to really hammer it home, we're gonna do a tomato ginger chutney with blackcurrant. Because why not? Why not? Let's live crazy. Okay, so where do we begin with all this? We've got ingredients all measured out in front of us. What do we have? So what we've got here, a whole host of different aromatics, and that's gonna be what really adds some nice dimension to these sausage rolls. Uh, we've got some Chinese black bean sauce, which is made from salt-preserved soybeans. Mm -hmm. If you think of like uh, what soy sauce is made from, this is kind of the base of it. So we've got that, it's got a lot of umami, it's got a lot of salt, it's gonna season the pork as well, so you're gonna notice we don't have any salt measured out. Mm -hmm. That black bean sauce is gonna be the powerhouse for seasoning. Okay. We've also got a Chinese five spice, we have white pepper, we have some slivered garlic, some minced ginger, green onions, and our most controversial ingredient, the MSG. Okay. It almost looks like mini snowflakes. Yeah. Now, is it easy to find the MSG in grocery stores? Not so much grocery stores, uh, but if you go to any Asian grocery store, it's pretty easy to find. It's all with the other seasoning ingredients, mm -hmm. the salts and whatnot, so. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start with what we have here is a pound of ground pork. While we were getting our ingredients together, we took an eggplant, split it in half, and then we roasted it until we got this gorgeous char on there. Mm -hmm. What that's gonna do is it's gonna remove a little bit of the bitterness from the eggplant, and then it's also gonna add a nice smoky note, which is gonna complement those umami notes in the mm -hmm. black bean sauce. Okay. So it's kind of the foundation of what we're doing is we've got a lot of bold flavors, but we want a lot of harmony, a lot of balance. We want everything to kinda start from one end and take it to the other, but there's a lot of excitement going on. So we've got our eggplant here. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna do is, wait for it to cool first of all. Mm -hmm. Don't burn your hand. We can handle it. <laughs> so I'll let you can take I the other. Can I do this with you? Absolutely. Okay. So we're just gonna take a spoon and we're just gonna remove all the guts from our lovely eggplant. And okay. We're throw them on our cutting board. And don't be too worried about, you know, am I scooping too hard? Are the pieces too long? We're gonna give it a nice, aggressive, rough chop. Okay. And this is gonna add a little bit of extra moisture as well to our sausage rolls. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever had a dry sausage roll, it's probably one of the most disappointing moments of your life. <laughs> you know, if that's the type of life you live, so. <laughs> All right. There we go. I'll just put that debris on our cutting board. And I love that roasting it, it comes off so nice and easy. Absolutely, like you could even just do a whole eggplant on the barbecue. Yep. Baba ganoush comes out fantastic if you do mm, it that way. Yes. So absolutely, I advocate. Okay. So we're gonna take our knife and we're just gonna do super rough chop. We don't have to care about what it's gonna look like. You know, if you think about it at the end of the day, once it's in the sausage roll and we eat it, yep. the size is not gonna matter because you're just gonna be chewing it. Okay. So we've got some nice rough choppage. That's that. We're gonna put all this lovely schlop in there. So everything just goes in the mix with the ground pork. Yep. 
And the beauty of this recipe is once you kind of understand the foundations of any very simple recipe, mm -hmm. you can dress it up any way. Like we could go Asian, we could go Indian, we could put like cumin in there, coriander, serve it with like a nice yogurt sauce. So it's... Yeah, I mean this base right here reminds me of something that we make. And what we've always made since I was a kid, which are stuffed eggplants. Yeah, right? absolutely. So you kind of scoop it out, mix it in with beef or the ground pork, put it back into that shell mm -hmm. and then bake it up. It's, it's yeah. such a versatile recipe and it's something that we could make large sausage rolls and serve it with a salad and you've got a great lunch. Or mm -hmm. what we're gonna do is we're gonna do little party sizes where we're gonna make little sausage rolls, chop them up nice and small, and then you've got like a great hors d'oeuvre. You can freeze them off and serve them uh, if you're in a bit of a bind for a lunch for your kids. It's something that I often teach people is learning recipes is kind of like building your wardrobe. You want a few good staples, and after that, then you want your statement pieces, but you gotta start with those good staples. So that's kind of what we're yeah. using here is the sausage rolls are a staple. Okay, so we've got our roasted eggplant in with the ground pork, what's next? Uh, now we're just gonna throw all our ingredients in. Uh, oh, so everything we have pre-chopped already? Yep. Okay, so we've got what, what's this, our bean? Yep, this is our black bean sauce. Can I go in and just kind of pour them all in for you? Absolutely, you live your best life there, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> now are we pouring all the five spice? Yep. If we didn't, I just did it, <laughs> I apologize. The Next we've got white okay, pepper. White pepper. Okay, that goes. White pepper's it's a very strong flavor too, so I was I was gonna people, ask you the difference between white and black pepper. It's just the maturity of the peppercorn. Okay. So white is stronger. Yeah. It's uh it almost has a mustiness to it too. Yeah. So it's I always advocate a little bit goes a long way, uh -huh. like a cheap cologne, you know, you don't need much. <laughs> so let me throw it all in here. I'm just gonna give my hands a quick rinse. Yep. Okay, so everything's gone in. Yep. And now we're gonna mix it all up. I've got my gloves here. Can I go right in? Absolutely. And this is kind of the part where to the, the chopping of the eggplant isn't too critical because as you mix it, it's gonna break down through the mechanical process. It's a nice low stress kind of approach to making something that it sounds super fancy mm -hmm. on paper, but when you make it, you're kind of blown away at almost the laziness that went into it. So. <laughs> Now everyone's got a different technique for blending up the ground pork and all the ingredients together in terms of mashing it up. Do you prefer someone to just kind of roll it in and scoop from the sides and bring it into the center and push in or just squeeze through your hands or does it really matter? I don't think it really matters. How you massage the meat. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on your mood of the day. Uh, you got something to work out, by all means, mash away. But. Yeah. Uh, the only danger I would say is the more that you kind of handle ground beef, the more risk that the heat from your hands is going to melt the fat that's mixed into it. Okay. And that's where we kind of encounter if you've ever had like a chewy meatball at an Italian restaurant. Yep. There's a good chance they've used a stand mixer and the heat from the friction, it's going to melt and then you just have a dry, you know, unfortunately disappointing product. And mm -hmm. if there's anything here that I can advocate, it won't be disappointment. So. All right, that looks thinking? fantastic. I think I could take off my gloves now. Uh, we've got our mix now. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna start working on our chutney. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna need for that is we're gonna do some comfy garlic. Oh, perfect. So we're gonna extract the cloves uh -huh. and then it's gonna go into this little pot of oil and then it's just gonna cook down until it's nice and roasty, toasty and caramelized. Okay. And then that'll be the next step uh, for the chutney. Perfect. So. so while Chef Sterling works on the garlic, we're gonna take a quick break, we'll be right back. But first, a quick kitchen tip. Being prepared. That means get all your ingredients ready before you even turn on that stove. What I want you to do is rinse those beans, chop up those ingredients, salt, get that all measured out. Why, it makes everything so much easier. Because the less you have to do while you've got that pot simmering on the stove, the better it is. What I find helpful is I even prep it ahead of time. Because this way, when I'm ready to cook, you're just popping it into the pot and everything's good to go. Also, it leaves you one hand free, so one's stirring and one's got your glass of wine. Cheers. After the break, we visit Chef Sterling and Kamloops on Dish with Mary. We now return to Dish with Mary. A few weeks ago, I made the trip down to Bright Eye Brewing in Kamloops, a pub-style eatery with an outdoor patio. Sterling and I chatted about family recipes, his passion for cooking, and keeping things fresh and creative in the kitchen. 
was cooking something you always wanted to do? Yeah, I, my mom has pictures of me from as young as I was like three. I was always in the kitchen kind of helping her. Mm -hmm. uh, the little kid on the stool, you know, helping stir soup and you know, all that fun stuff. I think it's something that's always manifested. I always think I'm gonna leave cooking. I think, you know, there's other things to explore and it, it always draws me back and I like it because it's something that keeps me connected to my family through memories, through recipes. What was the first recipe you can remember making or even a dish like you made either with your mom? So she has this epic barbecue sauce recipe. It is the type of recipe that goes storied through the history of our family. And it's something that she taught me and it's something that I've actually carried through my entire career. And we even have it at the restaurant now. We serve it as like our base condiment. Mm -hmm. And it's so versatile and I'm able to apply it to so many things. And it's something that she kind of taught me at a really young age is, you know, if you learn how to make 10 things in life and you learn three ways to tweak it, you've mm -hmm. got 30 fantastic recipes to kind of show off. I love that. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the history of Bright Eye Brewing. So Bright Eye definitely started as a garage buddy hobby. We have two brewers, uh, Brian Craig and Tyler Windsor, who actually the business is named after. It's a lot of dad humor. There's Brian and Tyler, Bry Ty. So I didn't get that until right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a level 10 I'm dad joke. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm a little behind on my dad jokes already. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Brian and Ty used to brew beer with each other in their local garage and uh, they'd give out the beer to the neighbors and the neighbors just loved the beer so much and they kind of got like a little bit of a community thing going on where everyone started giving them a little bit of money so they could buy better ingredients and then the beers were getting more well known. The boys started doing some local beer festivals called Brew Loops and then just based on the feedback from people drinking their beers they're like we might actually have a business idea um, which is where the other two owners came into effect is they were friends with these two guys and they're like, you know what, we really like what you're doing. Would you be interested in a financial partnership? And what if we made your hobby a career and opened up a business? And that's kind of how Bright Eye very organically grew into what it is now. And then how did you end up here? Used to work at another pub in town while I was in university. And uh, one of the servers who I was friends with, her uh, partner is actually Tyler, one of our brewers. And she'd mentioned that they were building a business, they were gonna need a chef. And she kind of kept bringing it up and I was always kind of rebuffing her because I was in university, you know, I'm getting out of cooking, we're done. And uh, then they built it and I came in to check it out and I was like, absolutely, like for sure I would like, I want to be part of this. You know, the beauty of academics is you can always return to it, but there's a timestamp on opportunities like this. So you can only say no so many times before they find someone else. And uh, yeah, I've been here for four years now. Brian has also described you as a culinary mastermind. <laughs> How does that make you feel? I think that's such a great compliment uh, because I would call him a mastermind of brewing. Some of the beers he makes, I've never heard of, and I'm not sure I'm not the only person who says that. They give me a tremendous amount of latitude in what I put out, and I think that's how we're able to be successful is they, they have so much faith in what I'm able to accomplish. So what would you say are some of your favorite menu items? We do a Szechuan style ramen, and I love that because I feel like to be able to take it from my brain to a page to prep to the plate and get such great reception, um, I think is a great reward for kind of being dedicated to getting things accurate and right. Um, some of the other wonderful things that we've had on our menu, uh, like our breakfast pizza, people love it because they'd never so think good. like, I can't have eggs on pizza, and it's like, a pizza is a blank palette. You can do whatever you want with it. There's no rules. So let's be crazy. Let's put eggs on there. Let's put sausage, potatoes, holidays. Mm -hmm. What are some of the reactions that you get from the guests? I love when someone comes up and they say, I don't know what that was, but that was one of the best things I've ever eaten. Because I like exposing people to things that they may never experience. It's kind of like getting to travel without actually going anywhere. Yeah. And I think that's the greatest compliment I can have is when I've helped expand someone's experience through food. And I love when I'm able to connect with someone and they can share their history or a story or something and teach me something. And I can go off and replicate it and provide it. And someone can be like, that tasted so much like my grandmother's cooking. And I think that's tremendous that I can help bring up those memories for other people too. What was it like during the pandemic and then coming out of it over the last couple of years? I think the pandemic, and it's always kind of a controversial way to look at it, is I think it was one of the greatest learning opportunities I've ever had as a chef. Because it's so easy to become complacent with the routine that you go through working in a restaurant. You know, you, you show up, you make the order, you cook, you clean, you go home. 
I think with COVID, it was so abrupt and so quick. And I'm so grateful that I work with a team of people that are so proactive. Uh, when the shutdown began, the next day we were back up and open. We had an online ordering platform. We'd already reached out to some delivery services. We made sure that we hit the ground running. Um, and that's kind of how we, we try to be is, don't be reactive, be proactive. This, we'd only been open for six months when the lockdown occurred. Okay. I think it was, it really pulled us together. If we had been maybe open for a year or so, we might not have been mentally prepared like that. I think we came out of it certainly stronger. I think we're probably one of the only businesses that came out of the pandemic with the opportunity to expand ourselves. Really? Yeah. Okay. The original vision of this business was we wanted a neighborhood hangout. We wanted anyone in this area to be able to swing by, have a beer, have a snack, no pressure, stay as long as you want. And as the business grew, we realized we need more space. People want to hang out here. What we're doing creates an atmosphere that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. So let's do something a little bit bigger. Let's be a little more innovative. We had the opportunity to take over the side next door. So okay. we started renovations last year. We tore down the wall, added a bakery. We added an arcade. We wanted something that was interactive. So if you were coming here and maybe you didn't live in the neighborhood, you didn't really need to leave. You have your beer, you have your food. There's some games, we've got TV. Like stay a while, hang out with us, we're fun, so. What does the future hold for Bright Eye Brewing? I think right now it's uh, it's getting our rhythm. It's a new business, it's a new energy, it's developing that new sense of identity. I mean, we knew who we were before, but now that we're bigger, better, brighter, it's where are we going as a team? And I think that's very thrilling because when you can't see the ceiling, all you have is room to grow. So I think it's just moving forward, inspiring the staff to do their best leading through that example and also teaching them that, you know, sorry to stumble, you're still going to win the race. So let's keep moving forward. Thank you so much for inviting me in, getting a chance to sit here with you, Sterling, see Bright Eye Brewing. I'm so excited. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you coming all the way to sunny Kamloops, this sun-parched, beautiful city. And I appreciate you being able to share my story with you. It's fantastic. After the break, the cooking continues on Dish with Mary. We get back to cooking our sausage rolls and chutney on Dish with Mary. Welcome back. We've got some pots cooking on the stove. Chef, what do we got? So uh, what we have going is uh, a little bit of confit garlic. Uh, confit is just a French style of cooking in which things are submerged in fat, slow cooked. Mm -hmm. Essentially what we're doing is we're cooking down all the sugars so they get lace and caramelly. It's kind of like a lazy man's approach to roasted garlic. Mm -hmm. um, and what's great is once we strain that garlic out, we're going to have all this wonderful oil that you can save for cooking, dressings, garlic bread. You can really do a ton of things with that garlic oil. And then in the other pot there, we just have two onions that we've julienned, so just thin slices. Once again, we don't have to care too much about what the knife cuts look like because once we make our chutney, we're going to smashed into oblivion. So <laughs> what it looks like now doesn't really matter. Okay, perfect. But I think where we're gonna go next is we're gonna do our sausage rolls themselves. They're gonna bake for about 40 minutes. So if we're thinking about what we're doing is almost like an assembly line or say you're entertaining and you have about an hour and a half till your guests get yep. here, we're gonna be organized. So we're gonna make our sausage rolls first. Mm -hmm. While those sausage rolls are cooking off, we'll jump to the chutney. By the time the chutney's done, the sausage roll's done and shebang, your okay, friends are well so fed. We've got a game plan, I've got my gloves on, where do we start? We're gonna start with this lovely puff pastry. That's beside me here, okay. Yep. Now do you typically wanna keep this fairly cool? Yeah, it's usually commercially sold frozen. So you're gonna wanna thaw it, but not let it sit out for too long because we don't want those fine layers of fat mm -hmm. to melt. Okay. Um, those layers of fat, they're gonna produce steam and the steam is gonna be what causes your pastry to puff up. The puff pastry. Puff so, pastry. <laughs> it's just that simple sometimes. It's deceivingly simple. <laughs> um, you could also make your own puff pastry. If you do, I will be so impressed. Very I will bow impressed. down to your skills. Yes. Uh, but for today, we're just going to use commercial puff pastry. You can find in the frozen section of pretty much any grocery store. Okay, perfect. Uh, so we're going to take our puff pastry. Mm -hmm. um, put one down here and this is going to be a grid part is there's not really a right or wrong way to fill it we don't have to worry about measurements really this is going to be a lot by touch can i take my own yeah absolutely do you notice i ask and i'm not even waiting for your response I'm like i got it <laughs> hey it's your kitchen you do you <laughs> Okay, so I've got my puff pastry down on the cutting board in front of me. What's next? So now we're going to reach into our bowl and grab our meat filling. 
And this is the part where we're really gonna decide, do we want a substantial sausage roll? And that would be something like if you're doing it for a lunch or a dinner, are we doing something that's more like appetizer or cocktail sized? Uh, what we're gonna do today is gonna be a finer one. So I start with a blob in the middle and then just kind of start pinching it. So now my hands are smaller than yours. I've put a pretty good blob on my technical puff term. pastry. Uh, pretty good, big handful. Yep, and then you're gonna kind of pinch it on the sides and then we're gonna flatten on the top. And as we do this, you're gonna notice it's starting to go out to each corner of this pastry. Oh, so we want it reaching... All the way, we're gonna do the, full the size sauce. Pastry. Yep. Okay. So just using the size of our hands, right? Yep. And you know, it's gonna be a little boxy, but once we roll it, it's gonna be the circular shape that we've all come to recognize from sausage roll. So don't be too worried about what does it look like. We're gonna cover it in pastry anyways, so once we're done, we're gonna take the pastry. Now, do you wanna leave just like a little at the end, on either end of the ground pork mixture? It's really, it doesn't matter too much. Okay. Once it rolls up, the pastry is gonna kinda of lock everything in, so we don't have to worry about anything kind of like seeping out. Okay. So then we're gonna take the pastry and then we're just gonna go over top. So just one side. Yep. I'm gonna do the opposite side so I can face you. And just roll it right over that mixture. Yep, and then we're gonna use our fingers, kinda of crimp it in, same kind of idea. Perfect. You're a pro already. I'll be out of business by the end of the week. <laughs> and then the next step, we're just gonna take a knife and we're just gonna trim off this extra. And this would be one of those things too, if we were doing a large sausage roll, we would use this full size puff pastry. Yeah. In the restaurant setting, I would probably do two logs of meat cut through the center and then each side would pinch over and you have two out of the sheet. Okay. But for this interactive tutorial today. Are we leaving about say half an inch of puff pastry where we've pinched it? If you want that Before presentation component, yeah. um, you could do a crimp along the side. I kind of just roll it right over like this. Okay, so it doesn't matter. Yep, that's the beauty of what we're doing is it's just, it's so incredibly forgiving. You know, the, the pastry hides all the flaws. So whatever we're worried about hiding, just pastry over it. Perfect. Perfect. What about the ends? Once it's finished baking, we're gonna trim those off as well. And that's kind of like that little cook's treat at the end where okay. As you're getting ready to serve it, you have something to kind of nibble on while you organize your life. So you're always thinking ahead, I love that. Absolutely, I'm a hungry man, so. <laughs> so we've got our baking sheet, and then we're just gonna strategically put them on top. Parchment lined baking sheet, yep. that'll work. Parchment, if you really love doing dishes, you could skip the parchment paper, but no we're here for, time for that. Absolutely not. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna grab this baking sheet and we're gonna do a little bit of an egg wash on here. Okay. Super quick and easy. Just a couple of eggs, a little shot of water. This is gonna add a glorious burnish to it. And you're just brushing that off with any pastry brush. Absolutely. And uh, because I'm all about equal labor, I'll mm -hmm. let you do one. <laughs> and then as you do that, we're gonna garnish as well with just some sesame seeds. Mm -hmm. So we've got our run of the mill white sesame seeds. We'll know and love, top our hamburgers, on our sushi. And then we're also gonna use some black sesame seeds. Okay, so I'm so glad you're using that because I've wondered, what's the difference between the two? Uh, the black sesame seeds are gonna be where you get the most pronounced sesame flavor. Um, it's just a little more intense. There's a little more bitterness to it, but it's actually a really nice way to add a little bit of a savory note okay. to some of your baking. Right. And you know, visually it's just kinda nice, so. For, uh, Multi-purpose here. So now we've got our sesame seeds on our puff pastry. All right. I'm gonna put just a little more. <laughs> it's a party. I love sesame. And then uh, we're just gonna pop it in the oven, okay. 350 degrees for about 30, 40 minutes. All right. So while Chef Sterling puts the puff pastry in the oven, we're gonna take a quick break. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. And now, a quick kitchen tip. Do your eyes water when you chop onions? I know mine do. I've got a little tip for you. What you do is you chop off the end of each onion, cut it in half, run it under cold water. That will eliminate, or at least help prevent, any tears from happening. Here's another tip, bonus tip for you, garlic. I hate peeling garlic. I really do, but I love fresh garlic. So I'm gonna give you a tip that some people may not be happy about, but I can convert you. 
by peeled garlic. Pre-peeled garlic is perfect. You don't have to fuss with it. You don't have to worry about finding that outer layer and messing with it. All you have to do, chop off the end and then crush. Mince, slice, do whatever you want to do. Dish with Mary will be right back. The cooking continues on Dish with Mary. Welcome back to Dish with Mary. We're gonna continue making the chutney. Chef, what's next? So we've got our garlic coming along. It's about where we want it in terms of confit. It's nice and garlic. It's gonna be nice and mashable. We've also got our onions that we've cooked down into this gloriously brown pile. So the next step is gonna be the tomato part of this tomato ginger chutney. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a French technique called tomato concasse. It sounds super fancy, it's actually super easy, but you can also brag to your friends that you're doing tomato concasse. So we're gonna go to the end of the tomato and we're just gonna slice in a nice shallow X. Uh -huh. That's about what we want. And then we've also got a pot of boiling water. So what we'll do is we're gonna score all these tomatoes. Nice and shallow, you don't have to get the knife too close mm -hmm. to yourself. I'll even let you do a can couple I try? of those. Absolutely. Now, I've done this for a while and I have never known the proper term or ah. terminology for it. So. And I usually say just put an X at the butt end of the <laughs> tomato. The X so, marks the treasure. Yes. You know, this technique is great if you want uh, chopped tomatoes for like omelets, anything where you don't want that uh, chewy texture from the skin. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got those X's in there. We're now just gonna plop them in our pot of boiling water. And essentially what we're trying to do is get the skin to separate from these corners. Okay. Once we start to seal them peeling away, we know they're basically done. Now, if we don't want to use a visual cue and we want to use timing for that, would you say around a couple of minutes or so? Absolutely, three, four minutes is pretty safe. Once we get past five minutes, we're really just boiling them into oblivion and at that point you're serving soup. Right, so we right. might have to pivot into what we're doing. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so now we're just gonna let that go. Can I just say it smells absolutely delicious in here. We, I am smelling that roasted garlic, that kind of deep nuttiness and mm -hmm. from the onions, it just smells so good. Just wanna grab some, put it behind my ears. Yeah, Italian perfume. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like our tomatoes are about ready. If you're not too sure, you can always just, in a very safe way, if you're cavalier like me, lift it out with a spoon or you have this gorgeous little basket you can raise that out and that's gonna make it a little bit safer, especially if you're unsure of like your depth perception or anything like that. Absolutely. So we're gonna reach our tomato out. We're gonna shock it, which is our fancy word for bringing down the temperature. Okay, so you're just putting it in a bowl of ice water to do that. Yeah, it's gonna serve two purposes. It's gonna stop the cooking process. Okay. Like I said, if we were gonna use this for like omelets, we still want some of that fresh meatiness from the tomato without it being too mushy, technical term. And the other thing too is that cold water is gonna cause the skin on the tomato to pull tight and it's gonna make it a lot easier to peel it. So we've done our little tester. It's perfect, this is exactly what we want. So now I know. The skin's already peeling back. Yep, it's doing all the work for us. Why work hard, let's work smart. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This is one of my favorite kitchen tools is the uh, pot with the actual strainer um, in, embedded into it. It's, uh, it's brilliant, like you could do asparagus, really whatever you want in there. Eggs, boiled eggs. Boiled eggs. So you don't eggs. have to go searching around the pot to find the eggs. That's smart, you, poaching eggs too, if you're yes. doing eggs benny, that's, that's smart, yeah. So now we've got our lovely little tomatoes, we're gonna meander our way back to our workstation. Okay. So, I'm gonna put you to work, I'm gonna let you skin these Absolutely. lovely I tomatoes. Absolutely, never ask. Okay, so grab the tomato. Now, are we just gonna leave the skins in the bowl or are we taking them out? Or you can happening? take them out. You can, you know, save the skins for later. These are great to throw into a tomato sauce. If you're making vegetable stock, this is a great source of MSG. Okay. Tomatoes are shockingly full of MSG. Really? Yeah, uh, if you're wanting to be super fancy, you can even like dehydrate them, grind them down. You can use it as like a little garnish. Yeah, I was just gonna say dehydrate them. Mm -hmm. They're really tasty. There's a, there's so much you can do. You know, food is wonderfully versatile. You just gotta be really confident in the foundations you have. Uh -huh. And I think that's part of the, uh, the joy of food is you get to connect with what you're doing, you get to learn. 
And the more you learn, the more confident you are, and then you're not gonna be intimidated by things. You're gonna walk into the kitchen and you're gonna be a pro. You're gonna make me wish that I knew what you were doing. And the reason why I love doing this is because I can use my hands to feel around Absolutely. for the skin. And that's the, the beauty of a lot of what we're doing today is mm -hmm. there's not a lot of slicing, there's not a lot of fine chopping or garnishing. It's, you throw it in a pot, mm -hmm. you can go watch some Netflix, come back, okay, cool, my sauce is done. Yeah. Are we done with the tomatoes or am I still peeling? Let's do the four. We'll leave that lovely survivor to float around. While you do that, we're just gonna cut these into quarters. If you're not super confident with your knife skills, you can just use your hands and mm -hmm. scoop the guts out. Okay. So, so you're just quartering it? Yep. Once it's quartered, then we can give it a bit of a rough chop. It, at the end of the day, it's not gonna matter too much because once we cook it down, it's going to be kind of negligible what these shapes look like because okay. it's just going to be all mush. Okay. Quarter it. Quarter. Yep. I stole the knife from you. I'm sorry. Beauty. And then while you do that, I'm going to throw these tomatoes into our onion mixture. Mm -hmm. Get that on some heat. I'm just going to quickly wash my hands. There we are, nice and clean, ready to go. I'll let you finish those two tomatoes and I am going to grab our wonderful garlic. And we're just gonna throw it right in there. I wouldn't be too worried about the oil. The oil is just gonna be extra flavor anyways, so. And then I've obviously added a lot of garlic. You get to choose your own destiny. If you love mm -hmm. garlic, use all of it. If you hate garlic, leave it out, you know. Yeah. We're pretty flexible here. Food is just a template. You personalize everything you do. How long do we simmer this down? This is gonna cook down for probably about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, you'll know because it's gonna start to look like a uniform mush. Okay. And that's when we know that we're in a good place. Uh, we'll throw this all in there. And then once we get the tomatoes, I'll get you to add all of our remaining ingredients, our aromatics. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna use some bay leaves, brown sugar, some minced ginger, five spice, star anise, which is kind of the star of this whole dish. It's gonna add a really nice exotic licorice note to it. Mm, um, yes. That is gonna complement the five spice that we have tucked away in our sausage rolls that are baking away. All of it sounds so good. And then uh, the other two ingredients we have, we've got black currants. And I like to think of that as a, a little nod to my British heritage. And that's what makes this a chutney. Um, I imagine you could also argue the tomatoes as well. Is that to add a little bit of sweetness as well? A little bit of sweetness, a little bit of texture. Yeah. yeah. Is yeah. it time to add all the other ingredients? It is, the moment of truth is here. Okay, so we've got some bay leaf. We've got bay leaf, this is a wonderful aromatic. Okay. Does it matter the order? Nope. <laughs> They're we all going in currants. We've got our black currants. Black currants. This is our apple cider vinegar. Yep. This is gonna add a lovely tang. Uh, brown sugar. Brown sugar. This is gonna be to balance mm. out the... Ooh, fresh ginger, no. Yep. Is it ginger? Yeah. Oh, yes it is. Yes it is. We've got, what's that, five We've spice? We've got our five spice. And this is my favorite, star anise. The star anise, which is a, a dried flower pod. And now we're gonna let her go. We'll give it a good little mixy mix. If you find that as you're cooking it, it's mm -hmm. starting to seize up a little bit too much or it's scorching on the bottom, yep. you can add a little bit of water to it. Okay. Um, we're kind of making sure that everything is cooking down uniformly and we get the right textures. So sometimes, say you let the tomatoes get a little too far away from you, but currants are, you know, they're dried. They're gonna have to rehydrate as they simmer down. Mm -hmm. You can just add more water and it's really about getting to the end result. It's not about strictly abiding by the clock that says, you And know, you don't want a high heat with that. No, you wanna go nice and low and slow. And that's also gonna help a lot of these flavors develop as well. Um, if you just kind of boil them away, it's just gonna be mushy. It, the end result's mushy, but the flavor's not gonna be great. So yeah, now we're just gonna let this cook. We'll clean down our station and by the time this finishes, it should time perfectly with our, uh, our sausage rolls, and then we'll be ready to plate. So while that's cooking down, I had a chance to come visit your sister Danelle in Kamloops, and we had a lovely chat about all things food, and we'll be right back on Dish with Mary. That and more when Dish with Mary returns. 
We now return to Dish with Mary. While visiting Chef Sterling at Bright Eye Brewing, I also had the chance to sit down and chat with his sister, Danelle, where I found out that we have a lot in common. Danelle, thank you so much for sitting with me, taking the time to chat. You're so welcome. Thank you for coming to our brewery. Now, there's something else I want to talk about because you and I share something in common. We sure do. We are both low vision. Yes. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit about your condition? All right, so my condition is called coloboma. I was born with it, so from the day I was born, I have not seen the world like anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I basically had to learn it that way. So how has that impacted your life? I think that I sort of teeter back and forth between wanting to be really independent, but then when I do need help, it mm -hmm. can be really hard. Asking for help, mm -hmm. acknowledging that I need help, or just acknowledging that I can't do it a certain way. Embracing the help, right? Yeah, embracing the help. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to do something different, to be something different. Speaking of, you're doing something different. <laughs> yes, I am a blind baker. I love it. Now, is this something you've always done? I think that I kind of drove my parents crazy in that I would haphazardly like try and make cookies and stuff like that. It was just sort of like a hobby. There was an opening available in the bakery here a couple of years ago. We needed a baker really badly. And my brother was like, just like, hey, the position's open. I know you like baking. I know you can do this. And I, I got so mad. I'm like, I can't do this. Like, you're crazy. And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he just kept pushing. I was like, fine, <laughs> I'm going to screw this up. I'm going to show you how badly I'm going to screw this up. Uh -huh. And I've been proving him right every day ever since. <laughs> but he saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. What has working at Bright Eye done for your relationship with Sterling? Sterling has honestly always been my biggest cheerleader. And at times, it's been incredibly infuriating. Because <laughs> he'll tell me these things, they're like, no, you're wrong. No. I just, I don't accept feedback very well. So I think what it's done is I've really expanded the breadth of my nervous system in terms of being able to receive feedback. So he can give me criticism and I don't have a meltdown about it. More than anything, it's improved the way that we relate to each other, the way that we communicate. Mm -hmm. We just did like a gigantic, stressful catering event. And just knowing that we could lean on each other to plow through that workload and deliver an amazing event together, mm -hmm. it's, it was like, Twin forces activate. Like it was, yeah. it was a relationship moment. <laughs> Do you find that baking has become more therapeutic, where it, it helps take it to a place where you're kind of at ease and at calm? Absolutely. Day by day, depending on like what I'm doing, I might uh, portion my dough a little bit more vigorously. Mm -hmm. um, when I started, you let your dough rise for an hour and then you punch it. So I used to say, okay, I get one bad thought a day. I'm gonna punch this one bad thought in my dough. <laughs> and I noticed as time went on, I didn't have a bad thought to punch into my dough anymore. That's amazing. <laughs> so now um, when I punch my dough, I give it one good thought. I give it one little bit of love, punch it into my dough, and that is the pretzels that I serve that day. One of my favorite things to work with above all else is dough mm -hmm. because I can hold dough in my hand and I can be like, I know what stage this is. I know what my dough is doing or I know what I did wrong, I know what calibrations need to be made or what the next steps are. It's very tactile. So now with this new love of baking, where do you find yourself? Where do you wanna go with this? I think really at this moment, I just wanna build up my skills. I want to learn foundations and then I wanna build on from that. I don't really have a scaled goal. So what advice would you give to potential employers or even employees with disabilities? Um, my advice would be always remain curious, never count yourself out, never count a person out, always give people a chance and that includes yourself. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for sitting. Thank you so much for talking. You are such a joy. So are you. Thank you so much. Sterling, it was wonderful and it was so much fun getting to meet and speak with Danelle. Absolutely. I think it was tremendous that she had the opportunity to meet you and have an opportunity to see someone who's a real role model in her community and really prove that anyone can do anything if you just kind of really apply yourself and be fearless. So. Oh, stop. Okay, go. <laughs> Say more. Uh, no, I'm just joking. But it really was. It was a lot of fun. Um, and she holds a special place in my heart. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm appreciative to hear that. 
We have now gone ahead and we've taken out these sausage rolls from the oven onto the cutting board. How is our chutney doing? Our chutney is nice and done. We've used an immersion blender. We fished out the star anise. We took the uh, bay leaves out. Mm -hmm. You don't want to eat those. They're going to be a little chewy, a little digestively challenging. Right. Uh, we used the immersion blender. It gave it a nice pulse, so we've got a good uniform texture. Uh, if you don't have an immersion blender or a food processor, you could use a potato masher, you could use a food mill. If you like it chunky, you could even leave it as it is. Mm -hmm. So really, you're the master of your own destiny in regards to where you're taking the sauce. Yeah. Um, maybe you want it chunky, it's really, what, really up to you. We're gonna go a little more uniform. Uh, so what we'll do is we're gonna slice these sausage rolls, and this is the part where you get to choose where are we taking it? What do we want to use it for? We're going to go an appetizer route for this. So we're going to do like nice tiny little slices. You know, if you're thinking of like pigs in a blanket, that's about the size we want. Nice bite sizes. Okay, so we're doing like pinwheels. Type Absolutely. Thing. Or, okay. uh, you know, like sushi bites. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uniformity. We don't have to worry about it too much. And like we said, the ends, they're a little ugly. That's all right. We're going to eat them before we serve them. So right. that's our treat. There you go. Those are perfect. Now, would you say a serrated knife or a sharp knife or? I think a sharp knife absolutely is the best. If you have a sushi knife and you want to brag to people you used it, <laughs> absolutely use it. A serrated knife, I would be a little cautious just because the serrations might uh, shred apart your pastry. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a good, nice, sharp knife is kind of the route we want to go. Uh, in terms of serving, like I said, I like to stand it up as we would with like sushi bites. And you're just placing them onto a serving platter. Yep. Oh, this smells so good. We're going to add the chutney to the top. And then I like to serve mine with greens. You could serve it with a salad. Mm -hmm. You know, you could just make these and eat them in front of the TV. Right. I've got a couple here for you. Perfect. Now, some of mine, I kind of butchered them. That's so would those right. be the chef pieces? Yep. OK. So we'll leave those for the chef. Perfect. And then we're going to take a little bit of our chutney. And this is the part where if it doesn't quite look the way you wanted it to, that's all right. We're going to cover it underneath this chutney. It's going to be tangy, sweet, oh a little God, bit of just, complexity. Yeah, scooping that right over top. But we didn't taste the chutney. I wanted to give it a little taste. Oh. Can I taste it now? Absolutely. OK. Did you finish scooping over top, or am I going to get my Oh, wow, that's delicious. It's got a little bit of everything. It's got a little tang. It's got some sweetness to it, so it's Absolutely. not overpowering. Yeah, it's it's nice and well-balanced, and that's why it's a great compliment to, you know, we think sausage roll. It's like, oh, it's a one-trick pony. Well, this sauce is going to teach it a couple new tricks. Absolutely. So. Okay, well, this looks and smells so good. I'm ready to eat. Are you ready to eat? I'm absolutely ready to okay, eat. Okay, let's go over. Yeah. I got the plan. If you're interested in making sterling sausage rolls and chutney, you can find the full recipes from all our episodes at ami.ca. Sterling, I had such a great time. Thank you for coming to cook with us. Absolutely. Today's been an absolute ride. I've had the best time cooking with you. And you have taught me so much and so many cute little tips, like adding sprouts as a garnish to the sausage rolls. I, I hope they serve you well because I feel like I just... I have so much knowledge about food and the poor people that get in my way when I start talking about it, so. <laughs> I'm here for all of that. <laughs> but speaking of food, let's dig in because I'm starving. Absolutely. All right. The moment of truth. We're doing chopsticks. And for you at home, thank you for watching and I'll see you again on Ditch with Mary. Cheers. Cheers. Production services provided by Frank Digital. Hosted by me, Mary Mamaliti. Guest chef, Sterling LaMarche. Producers, Chris McIver, Livy Lee. Director, Chris McIver. Director of Photography, Braden Music. Food stylist, Amanda Bebo. Produced in association with Accessible Media, Inc. Integrated Described Video Consultant, M. Williams. Supervising Producer, Michelle Dudas. Copyright 2023. An AMI Original Production.